Sound man's not responsible for that either. Thank you, James. We are so grateful for all that God does in our hearts and in our lives. And uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about being all in. Well, actually, for the next few weeks, if things go the way I plan it. How many of you know life doesn't go as planned? Next Sunday morning will be Mother's Day. We're looking forward to that. The Sunday after that will be Victoria Day. Some of you will be at Bethel Park. Others of you will be here. Marcus and Liz Brandt are home for their daughter's wedding. And she said, listen, I know it's a holiday, but can we come and see you? I said, sure. So they'll be here on Victoria Day weekend. The weekend after that, Teen Challenge the lady from the Lady Center up in Aurelia Way will be, down, will be here to share their testimonies. Listen, it's an op opportunities are in front of us for giving, for hearing, for offering thanks and praise to God, for bringing friends and family into the circle to hear the stories of God's goodness and grace. Why don't you come and be part of it in the days that are ahead of us. Well, all in. Maybe you've heard those words. Maybe if you, how many of you ever said, I'm all in? Anybody? There's a few, three, four. What does it mean to be all in? It means I'm going to give 110% for the cause that I've committed myself to. It means you're not going to stop short or walk away if things get difficult. It's about a commitment to give my all to the activity, to the relationship that I'm engaged in. And that principle is paramount when it comes to our relationship with Christ. Uh, maybe you're new to this church or to following Christ, but what I mean is that when Christ calls us into relationship with himself, and he does call, if he hasn't called you yet, he may call you while we're talking this morning. You just feel that gentle nudge of the Spirit. That's not anxiety. Don't dish it off as your anxiety. It's not your nervous tension. I should take my pill now. That's not what that is. You're in this house. The Spirit of God is at work because His people are here. We are being built together as lively stones, and you are inside a house that you can't see made of people that are around you. And the Spirit of God inhabits that house. And if he doesn't inhabit you, he may give you a nudge. And if he does, he may give you a nudge. Why? Because this is his house, not this building, this people. And that is an amazing thing to be part of. And Jesus calls us into relationship with himself. And if we choose to accept his offer of reconciliation and transformation... We actively yield to his leadership and intentionally submit to his lordship. Life changes. We believe that the Bible lays out for genuine followers of Jesus the way to do life. And if that's true of you, and you would say, yeah, that's true of me, then I wonder if you're all in. Are you all in this morning? Are you guided by the Scriptures, empowered by the Spirit in a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ? Jesus calls that connection at that 110% commitment level the abundant life. In fact, he used those exact words in John 10.10. 10. He said these words, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it more abundantly. He has come to give us life that is beyond the life that we can have without him. So if we want to experience this abundant life, he's calling us to be all in, to give all that we have and all that we are to his cause. Well, how do you get there? How do you know that you've done that? Well, Matthew's gospel 
speaks to us, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must do three things. Watch this now. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what can a person give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he will reward each person according to what he has done. So that sounds pretty heavy. Well, it is. So let's talk about verse 24. Verse 24. If you'll go back there, if you've got your Bible open, the Bible says this. He said, he must deny himself. So we're going to talk about those three things the next three times that I speak to you. Deny himself. Next Sunday, take up his cross. And then whenever... All these wonderful people stop coming through the church to talk to you. We'll talk about following Jesus because we've got some great people lined up to chat with you the next few weeks. Deny himself. Can I tell you this? Write this down. This is simple. Write it down. This is simple but not easy. This is simple but not easy. Let's pray and then get started at piecing it all together. What does it mean to deny myself? Father, we w work in your word because you promised that it would guide us to a successful conclusion where you were concerned. You have promised that we could have eternal life, life that stretches beyond this one. You promised that we could be changed to be suited for that life, that we could be prepared for that life, and that you would give instruction to us to get us there. So this morning we ask in Jesus' name, let your Holy Spirit come and make clear the stumbling words of your servant in Jesus' name. Amen. He must deny himself. I've heard all kinds of things said about what it means to deny yourself. Here's what I picked up. It's an essential part of the Christian life. If we consider how we pursue self-denial, we might associate with denying ourselves our own desires or some such thing. But what Jesus called upon those who wanted to be his followers to do was to reject the natural inclination towards self-gratification. Write that down. I'm giving you stuff. It's worth a million dollars. I'm going to tell you. Somebody said, I've seen that before. I've heard that before. Let me ask you this question. Then why don't you live that way? Write it down. Why? Because that's what it means to deny yourself. In a few minutes, we'll get to Paul talking about the flesh. If anyone wants... To be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The Greek verb translated here to deny in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, verse 34, can simply mean to deny the truth of a statement. But in the New Testament, the word Jesus used here always has overtones of a relationship. In fact, let me attach this word to something that you recognize. Do you remember the garden where John got Peter in when Jesus was going to be crucified at the high priest's house? And Peter had a little confrontation. 
And he denied that he knew Jesus. Denial always has to do with a person. Denial is not so much about stuff, although that may be connected. Another translation might be to disown or to renounce, as when Peter denied Jesus. He denies that he knows Jesus or has any association with him. So when Jesus says, deny yourself, who's he talking to? Who do you have to deny? Oh, yourself. Oh, you mean me? Yeah, you. It's not about you. You say, well, you, you don't know what I have to offer. Have you blind? I could care less. Because it doesn't matter outside of Jesus. I have to deny myself. So the words Jesus uses, deny yourself, are strong terms. Paul uses a similar phrase later on. But to deny is the Greek, I'll let you pronounce it because my pronouncing skills this morning aren't working. I found that out already. Denial in the New Testament is the intentional dissociation from relationship with a particular person. Another translation might be to disown or renounce. And if you want to know the context for it, or one that is easily discerned, it's Peter and Jesus. Philippians chapter 3. But these assets, Paul said, what assets? Well, he's just gone through a litany of lists about his past, about his heritage, his personal pedigree, his education, his involvements, his investments. And he said, if anybody's got any reason to be proud of their past and to have a past for the kingdom of God, I'm a really good Jew and I should get that past. But he picks it up in verse 7, these assets of a great heritage and a great education and great opportunities for involvement, I have come to regard as liabilities because of Christ. More than that, I now regard all things as liabilities compared to the far greater value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Let a man do what? Deny himself. What did Paul say? For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Indeed, I regard them as dung that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not, as a, not because I have a righteousness derived from the law that I've done enough good stuff that I should be a great person and God should take me, but because I have the righteousness that comes by way of Christ's faithfulness, the faithfulness of Christ to fulfill the promise and the purpose of God, a righteousness from God that is in fact based on Christ's faithfulness. Hmm. The purpose of self-denial, avoiding self-gratification, is to become more like Jesus and ho in holiness and obedience to God. Paul said, I abandoned all the stuff. Oh, it was good. My parents blessed me with a great heritage. I was blessed with a fabulous education. I was brought up well in my culture. But if I can get to know Jesus, if I can build a relationship with Christ, all the rest of that will fade into the distance as significant as it may be to others. The Lord himself exemplified self-denial in John's Gospel, chapter 13. You remember the story? 
They're on their way to the Last Supper. They get up to the upper room, and uh, John's gospel says, and there was no servant there. What was the servant for? Well, everybody needed their feet washed. It was culture and tradition. Never mind the fact that they were going to lay down on some very expensive furniture. <laughs> because the Jews ate laying down, not sitting down. They reclined on couches. You reclined on your left hand and left hand and ate with your right there. I, I got it right. I, I did learn that. <laughs> And ate with your right, but your feet were on these very nice cushions that were laid out for you. So before you got there, your hostess made sure that the servant washed your feet. Well, they all got there, and well, there's the bowl, and there's the towel. You see, the lowest of the low servants got that job. And so none of the 12 disciples, who, by the way, on the way in had been arguing over which one of them was the greatest, was about to stoop and wash everybody else's feet and show who he was. But you know what Jesus did. He saw everybody putting their dirty feet on the cushions and had mercy on the hostess. And then here's what he said. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. But if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, he said to the 12 guys that were sitting in front of him, you ought to be able to wash one another's feet. The greatest among you would be the servant of all. That's self-denial. That's disowning of the self, stepping away from my rightful place, the place that I owed, or at least that I think I'm owed, because that's what I've met in some people. And doing what Jesus would do. You say, what would Jesus do? Oh, it's right there. He would take the lowliest role and complete it. Jesus is not making a statement about whether you are bad or yourself is bad, but about who we are most associated with closely. The individual themselves, he said, should take then second place to God and to Christ. The question in servanthood is who is our primary allegiance to? Myself and me looking good or is it to serve those that are around me? And if what I'm about to do will not serve the congregation that is before me, then I'll shut up and sit down. Why? Because we're here to bless. The blessing is what we're after. Paul talks about overcoming the flesh. The willingness to die, deny one's own self-gratification in order to grow up into holiness and commitment. He says in Galatians chapter 5, 24, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What is the flesh? The flesh is my human tendency towards self-gratification. That's the definition. The flesh is my human tendency towards self-gratification. And Jesus is calling me to self-denial. Paul says that we have crucified the flesh. 
If you know anything about how, anything about crucifixion, you know that when you get nailed on the cross, you don't die right away. People lived on crosses for five days, seven days. That's why Pilate was so astonished when Jesus died so quickly. If we nail our flesh to the cross, let me tell you, we're going to still have some problems with it because it doesn't die instantly. Paul says, don't mess with it and don't toy with it, but I need you to know that you've affixed it to the cross by a decisive act of your will, but it's going to trouble you for a bit. So what do I have to do then? Because how do I know whether this is really me or whether I'm just trying to act out for everybody else that I'm trying to actually, in my great humility, I'm actually self-gratifying because I know that when I'm done, Pastor Mick will come and pat me on the back and say what a good fellow I am for my humble act. <laughs> How will I know if what I'm really doing is for the right motives? Because Jesus said, if you want to follow me, the first thing I have to do is I have to deny myself. Well, let's go talk to David for a minute. David writes in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If I'm going to truly deny myself, I'm going to have to yield myself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Because he's going to help me discern between. To see the difference between the humility and the self-denial that Christ is calling for and the false humility that sometimes shows up in my life when I'm hoping afterwards someone will just pat me on the back for being such a good boy. It's the work of the Spirit. David said, well, I could sit and gaze at my own navel and try and decide what my motives are. But notice David does not do that. He recognizes that there's an external outside party that's going to have to come in and help him discern where he is at. So his prayer as my prayer is, and your prayer is, is search me, O oh God, and know my heart. He's looking to the Holy Spirit for an accurate assessment of what is going on in him. Because David knows just to look within and figure out what is needed would be pointless because the heart is deceitful. Oh, there it is. Jeremiah said that. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? God, by his Holy Spirit, who would speak to me and instruct me in the way that I should go so that my relationship can become nearer and dearer so that I can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I say to you, Paul said, walk by the Spirit, and you will not, there it is, not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh and they're in conflict with you with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want i did it my way garbage not if you're a person of faith 
You can listen to Frank Sinatra and smile. Don't eat it. Don't even sniff the perfume. It's not good for you. So that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, then you're not under the law. So part of this process of self-denial is opening myself up to the Holy Spirit and letting him take inventory of my life to discern between the flesh and the new creation, the will of God and the desires that come from the old way, the patterns that used to be and the patterns that God wants for me. I deal with people in certain ways. I deal with them because it works. Quite pragmatic at times, Pastor Mick. Here's the problem. Sometimes my pragmatism is not spirit-led. So therefore, even though it works, at least in the moment... Some of the patterns that I've used to deal with people and perhaps even to deal with God may require some examination, but who is there that can examine me and actually show me who I am? Oh, well, it will be the work of the Word and the Spirit. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I say, well, how do you know that that will happen? How do you know that the Holy Spirit will actually do that? I mean, you're making all these great statements, but oh, well. Have a look. And we all, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. Where would you see the glory of the Lord? In the book? And we with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. As I stare into the mirror of the Word, I'm not reading the Word. I love the evangelist that told me that. He said, you're not reading the Word when you pick it up. It's reading you. That's the difference between this book and all other books. It's not the paper that it's written on, though I've got some with very nice paper. Some with very legible print, too. But it's not about the book as it is per se. It's about the word that is in that book that becomes a mirror to let me see. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is the visible manifestation of the invisible character traits of God. Write it down, you'll wish you had. The glory of God is the visible manifestation of the invisible character. God is not visible. You can't see him act or live or move. So how will you know what his glory is? Jesus said to the Father in John 17, I brought you glory. Why? Because I showed them. I did exactly what you told me, and they saw the glory of God. And Jesus says the mirror will show you the glory of God and that will transform you into that same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is who? Oh, it is the Holy Spirit. 
He is the one who transforms us as he did Moses in the Old Testament. You remember the story of the veil. He went in and spoke face to face as one who was God's friend came out. His face was glowing and he put the veil on. You remember that? The Bible says we are like Moses in this, that we approach God with unveiled faces and we are like he was transformed into the image of the one we communicate with. The Holy Spirit, if we'll allow him to, will show us in reflection the nature and character of Christ and empower us for change. That's why it's so significant and important that the Spirit be given opportunity to examine your heart and mine in the quiet, still moments of life. So instead of hearing my voice shouting, you can hear his voice speaking. What is God wanting to reveal to you about your life today? What's going on in your mind, in your heart? The steps God wants you to take, next steps in transformation, he will reveal if we will receive, if we will hear, if we will expose ourselves to his word. For those who belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So since we live by the Spirit, that is our life, let us keep in step with that Spirit. Paul says, you'll see the changes beginning to happen, but here's what I don't want you to do. Don't get conceited and say, well, clearly they're not following the lead of the Spirit. You just stepped out of step with the Spirit of God. Hey, hey, hey. Focus on the Spirit of God. Let us not become conceited, provoking and perhaps envying one another. Self-denial for the Christian then means renouncing oneself as the center of existence which goes against our natural inclination. And recognizing Jesus as Lord and Master, the new true center of our lives, and looking to him, denying ourselves what we can see and opening ourselves up to what he can see and conforming to what we see in him as the Spirit empowers us. For he has delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Because there in that place, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. So don't look out for your own interests, but take interest in others too. You must have the attitude that Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to hang on to, his status and his place in life and the spot he deserved. Though he was God, he didn't do that, no. Instead, he gave up his privileges. Isn't that what Paul said? And took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself how? In obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. One last thing today. Don't be Lot's wife. How many of you know that story? You remember the story? Lot's wife. Sodom and Gomorrah is about to be destroyed. Abraham's up on the mountain. God tells him what's going to happen. God says, get him out. So the angels go down to get Lot and his wife and their family out. 
In the end, they're struggling with, should I stay or should I go? I don't think they were singing that song, though. But um, the angels, the Bible says, literally grabbed them and pushed them out of the city. And they said, whatever you do, don't look back. But Lot's wife, Genesis 19 says, looked back. Why did she turn into a pillar of salt? Why did she look back? Well, the word to look there means to regard something with favor or pleasure. Lot's wife looked back with longing and saw the familiar, uh uh-oh, saw the comfortable place, saw the life that she knew how to deal with and the people that she knew how to deal with. She looked back at her former life and wanted it back. God said, finished. You say he's like that? Luke chapter 12, there's Jesus. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life, who lives for self-gratification, who refuses to deny himself or herself, will lose his life, but whoever loses his life will Preserve it. Let me finish up today in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says this is an ongoing struggle that we have. We are moving forward. We're not there yet. He said, not that I've already obtained this. That is, I've not already been perfected, but I strive to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. What was that? That he would become like Jesus, same as you and same as me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have attained this. Instead, I am single-minded, forgetting the things that are behind Forgetting all of the heritage stuff and all the stuff that life should owe me. And reaching out for the things that are ahead. I, with this goal in mind, I strive, I press on towards the prize. The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, he says, let all of us who are mature embrace this point of view. Are you mature? Are you forgetting what is behind and pressing on? All who are mature embrace this point of view. If you think otherwise, God will reveal to you, he's pretty blunt here, isn't he? The error of your ways. Nevertheless, let us live up to the standard that we have attained. You see, the experiences of abundant life are waiting for you and for me. And the Holy Spirit is ready to work through the circumstances of of our lives, to move us from self-gratification towards a fully being a fully restored person in the image of God, growing us into Christ-likeness so we can become more fully who we were created to be. So what's holding you back today? Is the Spirit of God talking to you about an area of life where you need to deny yourself? What part of your past are you hanging on to? What are you afraid to let go of? Perhaps take some time this week. Bow your head in the presence of God with the Bible open in your lap and pray with David, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. 
and see if there be any wicked way in me. And then don't leave me there. Lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray together. Father, free us from ourselves. You have freed us from sin and death and offered us abundant life in Christ. Help us in these days to continue to let go of our old patterns of life, our old ways of living with their tendency towards self-gratifying behavior. With the help of your Holy Spirit, reflect and embrace all that you have generously given to us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your attentiveness, Pastor Mick.